I want to invite you to, to take your Bible, turn to Micah chapter 6. We're going to be in Micah chapter 6 today. If you're at home, I want to invite you to take your Bible as well, Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. You know, as church people, we can be very opinionated, right? We can be very opinionated, especially when it comes to how we think Sunday morning worship should look. When it's, if it's the songs or how things look or the temperature in the sanctuary, even the translation of the Bible the pastor uses, we, we can have our opinions. Uh, I remember one time uh, I was leading worship and in the offering plate was placed a prayer request card. And the prayer request was praying that we would sing How Great Thou Art the right way. That was, that was a blessed Monday. Um, today, we will hear from the scriptures that how we worship God inside the church is meaningless unless we worship God with our lives outside the church. And the key truth that I want us to see today is that the church and the people of God truly worship God when we live like Jesus in the world. That's the key thing I want us to see today. And Micah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 provides us with a clear picture of what this looks like. God's people worshipped him through religious practices, through going through the motions, but not in their everyday real lives. And God spoke through the prophet Micah to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. But he was urging them to live in his character. And we see that perfectly in the revelation of his son, Jesus. So today we're going to see how we can live like Jesus in the world. Because as I said before, our key truth today is that the church and the people of God truly worship God when they live like Jesus in the world. So let's read together. Micah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. Oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him? And what happened at Shittim to Giddel? That you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. And with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Now today, as I said, the church and the people of God truly worship God when they live like Jesus in the world. And we're going to see how we do this. And the first thing that we see is we live like Jesus when we do justice. Now notice the first few verses in Micah chapter 6. God is setting up this scene like a courtroom. And he's bringing this case against his people and the jury are the mountains, these grand, ancient, tall structures. It's this, it's this incredibly magnificent scene where God brings these charges against his people. You see, God established the nation of Israel. He brought them out of Egypt into the land of Israel. But before he did that, before they crossed over the river Jordan, Moses gathered the people together. And God gave Moses a covenant between him and his people. And Moses presented this to his people. We see this in Deuteronomy. And what this covenant was, was a way of life. It was, it was the law between God and his people. is how they were to live. And it wasn't just a list of do's and don'ts and, and laws for them to, to know what was right and wrong. But it was a way for them to live 
in his character so that they would see the character of God between each other and that people outside the nation of Israel would see God through how they lived. But as we see here in Micah, as time has progressed, the people have walked away from that covenant. The people have followed their own way. Even when we see some of the kings of Israel have led people away from this, even to worship other gods. And so in Micah's time, we see that God is looking at them and bringing this case against them. Because even though the people were walking away from the way that God had them to live, they still were going through the motions of worship. They still were expressing their worship. They, their, the priests were still doing their job. But God saw that and he saw what they were doing and he saw how disingenuous it was. In fact, if we look back just a, a few chapters, in Micah chapter 2, we see an example of this. This is what God says in Micah just a few chapters back. The first few verses of chapter 2 of Micah says this, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. So God is looking at the actions of the people of Israel. And in their own country, this isn't how they're treating people outside of Israel. Their own people. You see this injustice happening among them. Where you've got people who are following pride, following greed, and they're doing whatever they can to take land and take wealth away from their fellow countrymen. The people of God, you, it used to be many people owned land and, and many people had at least a way to make a living. And as time progressed and greed began to infiltrate God's people and they followed pride, you see these folks, as we see in Micah chapter 2, devising ways to take land away from other people. And so you have a lot, this gap occurring where there's a few people who are becoming very wealthy and then there's several poor people. And God is very, very upset at this. And this is one of the injustices that God points out in the book of Micah. But there's also other things. We see other, throughout the book, we see other language about people who are facing physical injustice. There are people who are being beaten, who are being harmed. There's corruption occurring within priests, within the leaders of the day. And God's people are just looking the other way. Does that sound familiar? In Mark chapter 11... We see a picture in the life of Christ when he comes face to face with an injustice. If you would look with me in Mark 11, verses 15 through 19. And Mark records this. And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard him and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when the evening came, they went out of the city. We see this picture in Jesus' life when he comes to the temple and there's a space in the temple that, that's designated for those who aren't Jewish to worship. It's called the Gentile court. And these vendors have set up these booths and these tables to sell sacrificial animals. So that if you came to the temple and you didn't have a way to raise animals because you didn't have your own land, you could go and, and buy a, some pigeons or, or buy something to participate in worship. But they had set up all these tables in the place where Gentiles would have a chance to worship. And so physically there was a barrier that they could not cross so that they could not enter into the temple. And that's why Jesus is so upset. He says, my house was supposed to be a house for all the nations, but you've done this. And so what, what does Jesus do? He's not just turning tables over, but he shuts the temple down. He stops people from coming in because of this injustice. As the people of God, 
we must speak out and demonstrate justice in our lives. Now, C.S. Lewis, during World War II, C.S. Lewis went on the radio and during the London air raids, he was giving these essays where he was talking to the people, trying to describe the existence of God, describe the reality of God. Because many people are questioning, is God real during a time so evil as this? Is there really a God? And so C.S. Lewis, who was a former atheist, took to the radio with some essays. And those essays were taken and made, and that, that's what we know as the book, Mere Christianity. And in one of the first chapters you read in that book, one of the first essays that C.S. Lewis puts out, describes our sense of justice, how we know there's right and wrong. From, very er from a very early age, we can see right and wrong. I mean, why was our country founded 244 years ago? Because men looked across the ocean, they looked at their lives here, and they knew this was wrong. What do we feel like when we see men like George Floyd and we see someone kneeling on his neck for over eight minutes? We know that's wrong. How do we feel when we see the millions of lives taken away because of abortion? We know that's wrong. Those are big picture things that we know that's wrong, that we know that's injustice, that we can speak out and take part in. But the truth is, there's also a way we, we, can, we can do justice in our everyday lives. The way that we treat people in our business. If you're going to church on Sunday, but you're cheating people Monday through Friday in your business, what does it say about Jesus? What does that say about the Lord? What about how you treat your neighbors? How do your neighbors see you treat other people? What kind of conversations do you have? We must, with our voices, with our actions, demonstrate justice. We must do justice. That's how we live like Jesus. Secondly, we also see that we live like Jesus when we love kindness. Let's look back again in Micah. Remember in verses 3 through 5, he says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And when he goes on and he ends this passage with, to love kindness. Now this word kindness, it comes from my favorite Hebrew word, okay? Now, when I was in Hebrew uh, in seminary, I was taught by my Hebrew professor that when you say this word, like there's a certain H in Hebrew that you have to kind of get the back of your throat going in on. And right now, if you're dealing with allergies, can I get just a little bit of a hand raise or an amen, okay? Uh, you kind of get this going on, okay? And so the word that's for kindness in Hebrew here is chesed. All right, it's really easy to just go chesed, you know. And so our Hebrew professor would say, you've got to work it a little bit and get the H going. It's chesed. Now chesed, we see it a lot in Scripture. In fact, it's in Psalm 23 too, that uh, your love and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's really the word chesed. And that word chesed is translated more literally steadfast or covenant love. In fact, the same Hebrew professor described this word to me. It's the kind of love that the, the picture that, that they would see when they would say this word back in these days would be as a lion chasing down a gazelle. It's a love that chases after you. And this covenant love here that God is speaking through Micah to his people. Uh, a man named Gary Smith, he wrote a, a commentary uh, called the NIV Application Commentary on Micah. And he describes that this is a very, I mean, the, the covenant nature of this love is much deeper than just being kind to someone or showing mercy to someone. Your Bible may have a translation where, where, where this word is actually translated mercy. But it's more than just having an act of kindness for somebody. It's deeper than that. Has said, love is when we love God with every aspect of our lives. We love him on Sundays as well as Monday through Saturday. God wants us to love him in every action, excuse me, every interaction that we have with people and with him. He wants us to love him when we have our quiet time, our personal time with him, the way that we love our family, the way that we treat each other. 
And the reason this is, is because showing mercy to one another becomes more than just a simple act that, that we have in our lives, but it becomes an outpouring of Jesus in us. When we love God with everything that we are, kindness and mercy flows out of us. It reminds me of a, of a time, you know, Jesus was never timid like we saw earlier. He was never timid when it came to justice, but he was well known for his mercy. In fact, in Luke 17, verses 11 through 19, there's a story you may be familiar with. There's 10 lepers that Jesus comes across when he's going through Samaria and on the way to Galilee. Luke 17, 11 says this, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. They lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them and he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And they went and they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to them, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And Jesus, mercy just poured out of him because of his real hesed relationship with God. And he showed mercy on people. Not only, the, not only were these people lepers, but some of them were, were Samaritans who were hated by Jews. And he showed mercy to them, to people who were outcasts, who were fringe in society. And what if the world knew the church as those who showed mercy? I mean, can they say that today? We have ministries that help people in need. In our own church, we have a food pantry that happens, which you can be a part of, every month. And we give food to people in need. That's a big part of what we do. So I'm not trying to discredit that, but God is also, he's aiming these verses at an individual mandate. That we must show mercy, we must love him with everything that we are in our individual lives. And as the people of God, we must love God with every aspect of our lives so that his mercy pours out of our relationship with him. It's about being around God so much that you treat people like he would treat us. Now, we know this, okay? This is not something unfamiliar to us because if, if you've got children, you may, you, you may relate to this, okay? Now, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of cringe a little bit every time I hear my children getting on to one another in a not so nice voice. And I don't cringe because they're doing it. I cringe because, oh, I've heard that before. That may have been me talking at one point, all right? I cringe because our children, for better or for worse, pick up on our actions, on our behaviors, right? Because the truth is, now if you're, if you're in education, you probably have heard this before and you probably know this well, that more is caught than is taught so often. We, we, you can spend, and you, if you're a mom or a dad, I didn't know this, I didn't know this until nine and a half years ago. If you're a mom or a dad, you know that you can tell your kids something until you're blue in the face and it may never register. But when they see it, then it clicks. When they spend time around you, it clicks. And for better or for worse, that's the truth. Now, for worse, if I'm not always on my best, they pick up on that. But there's also times when, when Courtney and I are very intentional about showing love to our kids and engaging as a family, showing love, showing kindness, showing mercy to other people. We want them to see that in action. And it brings me great joy when, especially like on a day when we're all in the house together, like many of us have been for the past however many years it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's the thing where you, you feel like, man, we've just been fighting all day. And then you hear this really nice, just, you hear your kids treating each other so well. And you're like, oh, finally, something clicked, right? Or you see your children treat someone else, a neighbor, with kindness and with respect. 
And that happens not because as much as we've told them what to do, but because we've shown them what to do. Because we spend time with them and that pours out of their lives because of our relationship. That's the truth between us and God. We've got to love him with everything that we are. We must spend time with him. That's how mercy and kindness will pour out of our lives. That's when we will live like Jesus. And that's how we will love kindness. Now finally we see when we live like Jesus, or excuse me, we live like Jesus when we walk humbly with God. I want to read again one more time, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord? I bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. As I said earlier, the people of God, they lost their way. They turned away from the way that God had put before them. They broke the covenant between them and God because they followed their own way. They told God, I've got a better plan. Now, does that sound familiar? Have you ever done that? Have you ever said, you know what, God? I got this one. I'm good. I think I know what to do here. You know where that comes from? Pride. Pride is our enemy, and it seeks to destroy us. Pride drove Adam and Eve to decide that it wasn't good enough, and they wanted to be like God, and sin entered the world. Pride drove the people of Israel to reject God's way, to follow greed, to steal from their brothers and sisters. Pride pushed the priests to reject Jesus as the Messiah and put him up on the cross. The pride of the nation of Israel in Micah's time had blinded them so much that they thought their religious, religious expressions were good. They thought that, they, you know what, we're doing this we're checking the boxes. We're okay. And we can live however we want to live as long as we're checking the religious boxes, as long as we're going through the motions. That's what pride led them to do. And that's why God puts forth these ridiculous offerings of worship. He's not saying that he wants these things. He's trying to make a point with ridiculous rhetoric that he doesn't want 10,000 rams or thousands of rivers of oil. He doesn't want your firstborn. He's trying to show the, how ridiculous that is because it doesn't matter. And like I said before, he's trying to show that the worship of him is meaningless in a worship expression, in the temple, in the church, wherever it might take place. It's meaningless if we don't worship him with our lives outside the church. He's not trying to give us a compartment, a checkbox to fill. He wants us to worship him in every aspect of our lives. So that when we live for him, when we show his character throughout the week, then when we come to church on Sunday, when we worship him in the house of the Lord, then it's real. It's meaningful. It means something. Then our worship is about him and not about us. Jesus, he echoes this. Matthew 23, he says something to the Pharisees. 23, 23, in Matthew, he says this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So Jesus even brings this charge to the religious leaders of his day. When we walk humbly with God, we recognize his authority over us. We recognize his glory. In fact, the word for worship in Hebrew is shekah. And that word means to bow humbly before the Lord. 
The Greek word for worship, proskuneo, is very similar in its meaning. It's bowing before one in authority. And as the people of God, we must recognize his authority and his glory, declaring and believing that he is God and we are not. And how do we do this? How do we humble ourselves and walk with God? Paul gives us a perfect illustration of this in Philippians chapter 2. Verses 5 through 11. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen? Jesus walked humbly with God to bring God glory to bring God's plan for salvation, to pay the price for our sins. He emptied himself to pay the sins for all and become a sacrifice on the cross. And when we live like him, when we live like Jesus, when we do justice, when we love kindness and mercy, when we walk humbly with God, we see that we worship God. The church and the people of God truly worship God when they live like Jesus in the world. That's what authentic, that's what real worship is. I'm not saying that what we do here doesn't matter. But if we aren't living like Jesus out there, what we do in here isn't real. God wants us to live like Jesus in the world. That's how we worship him. And you know what? When we look at Micah 6, 8 through Jesus, do you know what we see? We see the gospel. We see the good news. We rejected God. We rejected his truth. We chose sin over him. And because God is just, the justice of God demanded a price for that. There was blood that had to be paid because of sin. But because of God's kindness, because of his mercy, Jesus gave his life on the cross to pay the price for our sin. We couldn't do it on our own, but out of the mercy of God, Jesus gave his life. And what's our response? To believe in his work and not our own, to walk humbly with God. That's the gospel. That's what God is calling us to. And today, I'm going to invite our, our musicians back up. Today we're going to have a time of response when we reflect upon the truth of the scripture. And we're going to ask, I'm going to ask you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be talking to two different people, two different types of people today. First, maybe you're not a Christ follower. Maybe you've been trying to get to God on your own. You've been trying to do as good as you can and you think, I'm going to live as good as I, as I can and do more good things than bad things and one day that's going to count and that's going to matter. But the truth is, is that it's never going to be good enough. And you know what? That's good news because Jesus paid the price for you. And today he's asking you to walk humbly with him, to believe in Jesus, believe in him on the cross, and put your faith in him. That's what it means to be made right with God. That's what will save you. So today, if you're not a Christ follower, I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to open up your heart to that, to give your life to Jesus. And today, maybe you are a Christ follower. You're, you're a part of the church. And I want to ask you to pray to the Holy Spirit to examine your heart today. Do you do justice? Do you love kindness? Do you walk humbly with God? Do I worship God with my life outside of these walls? That will be our reflection and our response today. Let's stand as we sing together and let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in this time.